missionary work for many, many years. And I'm going to go ahead and turn the floor over to him. He will also be speaking at the worship service. And we'll have a more formal introduction then. So I'll give it to you. Well, good morning. Good morning. Appreciate so much the opportunity to share some exciting news about what is going on in South America. over the many years and giving you an update as to where we are now with the work and what we're looking for here in the years to come. So we're grateful. My wife and I made the trip from Huntsville this morning, from Decatur actually, and our two children uh, were temporarily kidnapped by the grandparents. <laughs> you know, there's this thing about grandparents, whenever they get a hold of the little ones, especially if they live uh, 1,700 miles away, they just don't want to let go of them. So uh, we're childless this morning, but it's great to be here. Would you join me in prayer as we begin Bible class? Father, we're so grateful for your compassion and your mercy for your love and your grace, Father, for the opportunity you have given us to fellowship in your body, to, Father, to belong and to have a part in the work of the kingdom. Father, we're so grateful for the gospel and for the power that we see exercised, Father, in people's lives. Father, we're so grateful for lives changed and we're so grateful, Father, for the small part that we have in the great work of the kingdom. Father, this morning as we encourage one another to love and good deeds, we praise your name. We pray, Father, that everything we say and do this morning does that, Father, brings encouragement and uplifting and encourages, Father, to do your work. And at the same time, Father, we praise your name and glorify your name. Thank you, Father, for safety in travel. Thank you, Father, for the night's rest. And thank you, Father, once again, for unity, love, and compassion in Jesus Christ. We're grateful, Father, and it is through Christ that we pray. Amen. Okay, I have a few slides, and what I'm going to be doing here is I'm going to be showing you sort of the strategy that we have utilized over the many years and all the work that we have been able to accomplish and I'm also going to be encouraging you to join us maybe next year in a mission trip that we're planning. We do a yearly mission trip that we take people. There's uh, members from many other congregations that have joined us in the past, and I want to extend that invitation to 4th Street. Maybe this is an opportunity that you haven't heard about in the past, and I'm excited to share it with you. So first slide here is the name of the mission work that we are doing. It's Colombia para Cristo. If you know a little bit of Spanish there, that is Colombia, the specific meaning is Colombia belonging to Christ. That is our vision here as to what we want to do. So let me take you in a biblical perspective here to the relationship between Paul and the Thessalonians. You might remember back in your Bible class that Paul established the congregation in Thessalonica after taking his effort to go back and visit some of the congregations that he had established in the past in his first missionary journey. So we're talking about this is part of his second missionary journey, Acts 16 or so, a little bit before 16, 15, towards the end of 15, he starts talking about going back and visiting these congregations. So the map here shows Paul starts his journey in Jerusalem and makes his way all the way to Troas. And here is where he receives what we call the Macedonian vision or the Macedonian call. Remember that? Paul gets a vision uh, in the night, and this vision is a Macedonian man, and tells Paul, come to Macedonia, come over to Macedonia and help us. So this is the first time that the gospel makes it across 
and into the European soil. Paul lands in Kavala, Neapolis, and from there, after Philippi, he makes his way to Thessalonica. And Thessalonica was a Roman province there, major trading center, and several other elements there that made the place for the establishment of the church there very ideal. So Paul goes and starts preaching. And this is Acts 17, verse 2. According to Paul's custom, he went to them, and for three Sabbaths he reasoned with them from the Scriptures. Shortly after, persecution arises, and Paul is basically run out of town. After three Sabbaths, that's three weeks. Three weeks is all that Paul had the chance, the opportunity, the blessing to spend with the Thessalonians. And then he goes on to Berea. You remember the Bereans were known very specifically for one character, for one thing in the life. Anyone can help me there? What were the Bereans known for? That's right. They were more noble than those in Thessalonica. And the reason they made them more noble is because they searched the scriptures daily as to what Paul was saying, whether it was the truth or not. Okay, so then Paul eventually makes his way down to Corinth. And from Corinth is that Paul writes First and Second Thessalonians. So what I want to make here, the connection is the relationship that was created in just three weeks, just three short weeks, the relationship that was created between Paul and the Thessalonians. This is First Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. And I want you to notice here the language that Paul is using. But we, brethren, him writing to the Thessalonians, having been taken away from you for a short while, in person, not in spirit, we were all the more eager with great desire to see your face. For we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, more than once, yet Satan hindered us. So that love, that unity, that special fellowship that was created once again, only three weeks, was so powerful. Paul wanted to go back and he wanted to bless them. He wanted to spend some time with them. Here's chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, Paul writes, when we could no longer endure it, we could endure it no longer. We thought it best to be left behind at Athens alone. So this is Paul's expression of his heart. He's having a good mission effort in Athens before he moves on to Corinth. But Paul has this great concern in his heart for the Thessalonians. And he said, it's better if we send someone there. And that's when Timothy goes on to Thessalonica. And Paul is left there in Athens all alone. Not an ideal situation for mission work whatsoever. But his heart, his unity, his devotion for the Thessalonians was such that he was willing to do that. So once again, Notice the relationship that was created in such a short time just between a missionary and a congregation. And here's another one. As we night and day keep praying most earnestly that we may see your face and may complete what is lacking in your faith. So we are very aware of how important it is to go and preach the gospel to all the nations. And we make a good effort at doing that. But what sometimes we lack is the understanding that once that fellowship, once that relationship has been created, it is a biblical example, precedent. It is a biblical direction to continue with that personal relationship between the congregation that has planted the mission work and the mission work itself. You see, 
it is not only about the financial support that we provide to the mission work, but it is about our physical support. It is about us continuing to build and maintain that spiritual relationship that once again is created. The word that Paul used back in uh, chapter 2 in Thessalonians in regards to their separation that Paul says, we were taken away from you for a while. The word there that he uses is the same root word from which we get the word orphan. So that relationship between parents and children that is unbreakable and when it's broken, it leaves these terrible consequences. That's the same word that Paul uses. What's the point? It is incredibly important that we understand that our physical presence, that our visual, that our face-to-face -face contact with mission work, it's vital for the sustaining and the success of the work. The unity in the Lord was based on this biblical love. This is the very same principle that we have utilized in missions ever since the first year that we started this. this. These are just old pictures. When we started the work back in Colombia, elders from other congregations, deacons from other congregations, we have sent and taken with us people from multiple congregations, even from other countries. Even members have come from Europe to come and support the work there in Colombia because we have made it very clear that our connection with the planted congregations is vital. This is a picture when we took a group to Colombia, to Sipaquirá, and this is when we first planted the church in Sipaquirá back in 2014. It was a group, once again, that was composed of members of the church here from the United States and also members of the church there from the Bogota area. It was a group of people, church people, members of the Lord's church working together. Uh, we have great opportunities of fellowship with them. We spend all day together from early in the morning. We have breakfast. We have devotionals. We go out in the streets and we preach the gospel. Sometimes we do door knocking. Sometimes we do singing presentations, which you will be seeing some pictures of that, and I'll explain that. And at night, we have lectures. We have just gospel meetings, sometimes at members' homes, sometimes at guest homes. Someone that says, hey, I would love for you to come to my house and teach a Bible lesson, and they invite their neighbors. This picture is actually of a fellowship that we are having there in Colombia. Notice here, we understand how important it is that we continue to support the work with our physical presence. And we continue to do this year after year. So there's a strategy as to how we have done this over the past 20 years and more. We recruit and train those whose hearts are eager to share the gospel with those outside our borders. You see, mission work is challenging. Mission work sometimes is very uncomfortable. Mission works sometimes can be risky. Mission work many times is dangerous. And not everyone is inclined, is willing to participate in this type of work. Now, there's no doubts that there's those whose hearts are called for these. So we try to recruit those people, we try to encourage those people, and we provide some training, some cultural training, some language training. And the picture here is of one of our groups that is getting ready to go to South America in one of our mission uh, trips. I want to direct your attention back here to the back of the, of the room. This homemade phone stand is actually a little cool device. And what we use with this, and this is not the only one. This is just the one we were using that time. 
is where we put the phone because we live stream, we record, and we play the mission training and the cultural training presentations to other members of the church that might not be able to come to the mission training themselves. So this is in Peoria, Arizona, but we have also live stream this mission presentations, not mission presentations, this mission preparation meetings onto other congregations. So what's the point here? We are very, very interested in helping you understand the culture, helping you understand the language, and helping you understand just the church themselves. Because as you come there to participate in this type of work, it's very important that you are already familiar with what is happening there and that you have a connection, a previous connection with the church there. So we make a very, very good effort. We also do some language training. And I enjoy saying this because I've seen it happening so many times. Normally we know how to ask for directions or how to ask for a specific thing. Like, how many of you understand clearly when I say, ¿Dónde está el baño? ¿Dónde está el baño? Raise your hand if you understand that. Okay, there's a few here. So that means, where is the restroom? Where is the bathroom? So most people know exactly how to ask that question. So they feel very well prepared to go to the mission field. I know the basics. If I, if I get in trouble, I just say, ¿Dónde está el baño? And then there you go. I mean, if I know where the kitchen is and the bathroom is, I'm in good shape. What many of them don't quite fully understand is how to receive instructions. So you might ask a Colombian, ¿Dónde está el baño? And you feel really good and accomplished by yourself. It's like, I said it right. And they understood. What you might not have a clue is how to understand. Bueno, tienes que salir de acá dos cuadras hacia adelante. Ir hacia la derecha. Cuando llegas a la esquina, vas dos puertas y ahí está el baño público. And I get those faces exactly. What? I just wanted to know, ¿dónde está el baño? Well, that's exactly. Anyways, the point here is that we truly make a cultural connection between the missionaries and the local church. So there is a powerful love, unity, and fellowship that takes place. Now, a question that gets asked all the time, well, do I know, do I need to know how to speak Spanish in order to go there? Because of course, it's a Spanish speaking country. The answer is it will be tremendously helpful, but it is not required. Why is that? Colombia is a very modern country and they teach English from kindergarten. Especially younger generations, you would be surprised, or maybe not, you will be able to have a full-blown conversation in English with many of them because the country is moving that direction. So you will be able to be useful to the Lord even if you do not know exactly how to understand the directions as to donde está el baño. You'll be just fine. Anyways, we travel all together as a missionary team. And once again, these are the strategies that we have utilized for the past several years that have brought the success to the mission work that we have been able to enjoy together in the Lord. We exercise all security measures. Traveling now in COVID or after COVID is different. There's a lot more rules. There's a lot more things that we have to take into consideration. So we're very careful as to making sure that everyone is fully safe, that everyone has all of the elements required. And the picture that I'm gonna show you here is a perfect example of all of these security measures and all of these things exercised all together to have the most beautiful mission experience whatsoever. This is an actual picture of a group of missionaries. Not really, I'm just kidding with you. But we truly do make sure that everyone that travels understands the risks, understands the challenges, and is very well prepared 
as to what we're going to be experiencing all together. This was last year. It was quite challenging trying to do a mission work while the country is still shut down for COVID. What we did was we rented some private transportation in which we were able to take several members of the congregations, both in Chia and Sipakira, to go and help us plant seeds in the new work which was established in 2020. Imagine yourself being excited. Imagine yourself being ready for the mission work and heading on to the mission field January 2020. And then you get there and you're getting ready to preach the gospel. And just three months after the entire world gets shut down and you don't have the opportunity to go out, you don't have the opportunity to visit people. Well, the congregation there in San Gil was sorely needing the encouragement, the love, the presence. And that's why we decided to take a very, very challenging mission trip last year. It was one of the most challenging ones. I could spend here hours telling you all the preparations and all the things. But what's important about it is to be able to experience the encouragement, to be able to experience that Christian fellowship that can only be experienced when you have the opportunity to spend time one-on-one -on -one with God's people. The church in San Gil is doing very well. It is one of our youngest congregations, and you're going to be seeing here one of the most recent pictures of the church there. So continuing with this thought of as to how we continue to do this work. So we distribute the work, we partner with the local brethren, and we give very specific instructions. Once again, this is year after year, the pattern that we have followed and has been very successful planting congregations there in Colombia. We team up, we divide into several subgroups. We all stay together. And sometimes we uh, are very successful in what we're doing. Sometimes we have some really rough days. I remember uh, one campaign, we were handing out flyers onto, uh, in a public plaza. And they were this actually very nice uh, flyers that we were giving people. And I don't remember when I stopped counting, but it was several that we would hand out the flyer to someone and the person would just look at it. And uh, as soon as they saw something about church, they would just get the paper, crumble it, and throw it in the floor. And the plaza was covered with just crumbled papers. Well, part of our good citizen uh, strategies, actually we went and picked them up. Some were able to be salvaged and uh, given to someone else. Most of them were just ripped and we had to pick them up and throw them in the trash. That's discouraging. You see, you put in all this money, you put in all this effort, you're doing all these things to bring something that is life changing and people don't appreciate it. But then you have beautiful days in which you just get to the right place and people's hearts are open and you have the opportunity to really impact what they're doing. We don't take the discouraging days and base what we're doing in just discouraging things. We understand that there will be good times and we understand there will be some challenging times. So we go together to public classes, as I was saying, and this is just one of the smallest groups that we have taken uh, here in the front. You can see my wife. And what we do is we actually start singing in English in a public Colombian Plaza. So as people are coming and walking by, they hear this singing in English and they are their attention. What is happening? Who are these people? For well, those of us that can't speak the language, that can interact with those that are interested, we give them the flyer, we invite them, we sometimes spend many, many hours with them in the day just because they are so excited to be able to be a part of this. 
Here's another picture of a larger group in front of a Catholic church building. And this was a very interesting one because we were doing some singing there. And I remember the priest came out of the Catholic church building and was trying to figure out who these people are and what are they doing here. And I had a very nice conversation with him. I told him, all we're doing here, sir, is we are singing out about God's blessings. And anyone that is interested in reading the scriptures uh, is welcome to join us. And he had absolutely no problem. There's been some places that we have been that as soon as we arrive, we don't want any of that here. You move away. We want nothing to do with that. Once again, mission work can be challenging. But if we just stay with the challenges and base our strategies just in the discouraging things, I promise you that the work of the Lord would not be progressing in many places as it is because we have tremendous men and women of faith that are very encouraged. This is a precious picture and it's very close to my heart. This is one of our most successful mission efforts and elements that we try to go there year after year. This is an orphanage home. And these children here in Colombia, they're called Los Hijos del conflicto or los niños del conflicto what that means is that these are the children of the conflict this is the other side to the war with drugs and narcotics that we don't get to see you see what happens there is that these armed groups come to smaller communities and sometimes they devastate the entire community and the children are left without anyone in the world. Well, there's a good effort that the Colombian government is doing to go and collect these children and they take them to these orphanage homes and they care for them. They have no one in the world to care for them. What a precious opportunity to bring the gospel to children that are hurting in such a way and present them a way of hope and opportunities for life. This is one of our most elaborate and most successful works that mission campaigns that we've done. If you don't recognize the man here standing beside me, this is me as a translator. This is John Clayton. John Clayton is one of our most successful advocates in regards to Christianity and science, in regards to the Bible and science. He is a presenter of Christian evidences from a scientific standpoint. John Clayton, a professor, university professor, saw the need in Colombia, and he made an effort together with his team to come and make these tremendous mission presentations in regards to Christian evidences. You see, we change the strategy slightly year after year, following the leadership and guidance of the local church as to what it is that they're needing us to do year after year, then they will guide us and encourage us to spend time doing that. Sometimes, as I said, we go to public plazas and we sing. Sometimes, we go to hospitals and we read scriptures to the people there and we provide tremendous amount of encouragement. Sometimes we just preach the word. Here, let me uh, direct your attention. You might not be able to see it so well, but this is a portable speaker. So this is something that we did a couple of years ago and it was very successful. We actually had a rechargeable portable speaker that we would take to the different locations and one of us would just start reading scripture and making a personal invitation to everyone that was passing by in regards to reading the scriptures, in regards to knowing more about God. We got tremendous amount of responses and all of this is once again supporting the local missionaries as they continue to do the work, we can provide 
large amount of contacts that the missionary team collects in the week or two weeks that we're there, and then the missionaries can follow up with these people that are interested in the gospel. Um, this is another very uh, close to my heart work. This is a drug rehab home. All of these young men that are part of this group home are somehow related to the conflict of drugs and drug addiction. So Colombia has tremendous amount of problems with drug and drug addiction, not only because it's so easily accessible to the people, but because many children, as we were looking at the children of the war, the children of the conflict, are forced to work in illegal activities and they are forced and they are raised in this type of environment. It's really hard to get away from that, but many do get away from that. They have opportunities to reinsert themselves to society and we have made a powerful connection with many of these institutions to be there supporting them as they go through their rehabilitation process to start life again. What better place to start life again after a devastating lifestyle like this than Jesus in your life and having the support of the church. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. You know where that comes from? Acts chapter 2. This is when the gospel was preached and the church started. And what we see in the scriptures is that when people are willing to preach the word of God, when people are willing to step out of the comfort zone and go and bring the good news, God follows through with his promises. God opens hearts, God opens doors, and there's great opportunities for the gospel. These are just some of the pictures of some of the baptisms that have taken place over the years. We receive monthly mission reports, which we share with all of our supporters. And it is so encouraging to see as the church continues to grow every month. What an incredible blessing it would be if we would if we were to get, and I'm not just talking about the mission field, I'm talking about the church in general. If we were to get to the point in which day by day, the Lord was adding to the number. Imagine if we had baptisms every day here at Selmer. What, a, what an ideal, what a dream. And that's how we see it. But that was real back in the first century. Brothers and sisters, what the world needs nowadays more than anything is the gospel, Amen. is the word of God. And we as Christians are commanded to bring the word of God to the lost world. If we follow through with what God asks us to do, God will follow through with his promises. Just some more pictures. Sometimes we baptize people in a pool. Sometimes we baptize them in a large river. Sometimes we even baptize them in the bathtub at the hotel. Any place that we are at the moment, any place that we have, <coughs> excuse me, the opportunity to immerse, fully immerse a person, we do this. These are some of the baptisms, some of those young men that I showed you prior in the drug rehab home, giving their life to the Lord Jesus. Many of these men have fully completed their rehabilitation program. Now they're leaders in the local congregation and they're bringing others unto the Lord that they have connections with. It is a work that continues to grow. It is a work that continues to increase. So at the moment in Colombia, we have three fully self-supporting congregations. This first picture is the church in Chia, which is the oldest congregation we have in Colombia. It's about 12 years old. I'm sorry. It's about 14 years old. The next one is the church in Sipaquira, which is about six to seven years old. 
And then this is the newest congregation that was planted a couple of years ago in San Gil. Now, you might ask, how do you get in such a short time to be a fully self-supporting congregation? Some of the things that we have experienced in the past in regards to mission work is that we continue to send money and send money year after year, year after year. And it doesn't seem like there is really an opportunity or there's really a, a, a growth that takes place that these people will always depend. And I'm not talking anything negative. I'm just saying realistically, if we don't send them the money, they cannot make it on their own. Well, they actually could. And this is the mission strategy that we have established and we have planted, we have utilized from day one. What is that? We make a commitment with one missionary family. And that commitment is that we're going to take care of them entirely for all of the living expenses. Part of the commitment is that they will start the congregation in their own living room. And they invite neighbors and friends and they meet for months, sometimes for years in the living room. As they expand, as they baptize people, as they continue to grow, their congregation is going to need to either buy a place or rent a place or move to a larger location. We entrust the brothers and sisters with the responsibility that as they grow, they take care of the needs of the congregation. Now, this is very important because sometimes things happen back home that are completely out of our control. And sometimes our mission budgets have to be cut short because there's other things that the congregation has to do. The problem comes when a foreign mission field is fully dependent on the American dollars and that money cannot go anymore. I have seen this happen multiple times. Congregations just disband. Bills cannot be paid. Buildings are sold just because they don't have the capacity to continue to support themselves. Well, if we entrust them from day one, and once again, as the congregation grows and as the congregation has more need, we entrust the brothers and sisters to take care of their own financial needs. We have been able, once again, to establish congregations that are fully supported. Let me tell you something. This is just the starting point. Our vision is to have an entire country belonging to Christ. If you don't know much about the geography of the country, Colombia has a current population of over 51 million people, and we're just getting started. This map here shows you in the Cundinamarca Department State. Uh, this is the area where the first two congregations were planted, Chia and Sipakira. And as you can see the division of this state, there's many small little towns and by these, I mean sometimes are 20,000, 30,000 people that do not have a congregation. And here is a map of the entire country. Colombia has 32 states. We call them departments. And there is so much work that we are committed to do. The primary work that we're doing is here in Cundinamarca. And we just went on to the Santander State, which is the newest congregation in San Gil. The churches are doing well. The churches are taking care of their own needs. And we are planting congregations that, Lord willing, as time continues to pass and needs continue to emerge, we are teaching these brothers and sisters that it is their personal responsibility to take care of the growth of the congregation. We have been very successful at this, and this is the same type of work that we started doing back in Venezuela when my wife and I were missionaries ourselves. Some of you might remember this. 
more than 20 years ago, I came here, recent graduate from Harding University, with my little boy, two years old, that now is back at Harding in his junior year. He's 20 years old. I can't even believe that. It's hard for me even to say that. But we started this mission strategy of planting congregations that as they continue to grow, they could take care of themselves. I would be more than delighted to show you and share with you the work in Venezuela. Venezuela is in a whole lot of trouble for many reasons, but the church is growing there. The congregation that we were able to plant with the blessing of the Lord is doing very well, and that congregation has expanded onto the Amazon areas. And last we knew, there were six other congregations that were planted from this one congregation. The partnership that Fourth Street has with Colombia Para Cristo is a partnership of many years. And what I want you to understand is that what we're doing is doing mission and church planting work. We move from location to location, supporting one missionary family. And as the congregation grows, as the congregation can take care of themselves with local leaders, we move on to the next location and we start another congregation. This work is going to outlive me without any doubts, but it will not outlive the mission and the vision that God has for Colombia. We believe in this. We believe that Colombia can be one for Christ, and that's exactly our mission strategy. So next year, Lord willing, we will be having a mission trip of this type of strategy, of this type of work as I'm presenting to you, and I want to give you the opportunity to join us. All you are required to have in order to come with us is love for the lost souls and love for the local church. If you're interested in participating with us physically in this type of work, I encourage you, we'll keep in touch. Brian and the elders have my email, phone numbers. I'll be more than delighted to share it with anyone that would be interested in coming with us. Colombia para Cristo, many years to come, Lord willing, many years to go. Vision and strategy, it is to continue to plant congregations. And I am just so grateful once again on behalf of the churches in South America for your faithful support over the many years. We have brought many people to Christ. We have changed many people's lives. And as I said, we're just getting started. Thank you again for your time. I know that uh, time is clicking here. And I appreciate your presence here, your encouragement, your prayers. And I pray that this has been encouraging, exciting, and maybe it has piqued your interest to participate in something that is very successful and that we truly are seeing tremendous, tremendous life change there in the mission field. Would you join me in prayer as we finish here with Bible class? Okay. Father, we're so grateful as we see the work of the kingdom continuing to progress, Father, and as we see your precious hand, Father, being active in many places in the world. Father, we're so grateful for the small part that we get to partake, to participate, Father, that we're honored to be a part of in Colombia. We pray, Father, that you continue to give us a heart that is always seeking for opportunities to improve what we're doing, Father. And we pray, Father, that we're always having a heart to love and seek those, Father, that are seeking you. Bless us, Father. Continue to keep us in your care, your mercy, and compassion. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you again for your time.